Hello and welcome back. This is a video I've wanted to do for a long time. I review a ton of leather goods, and I'm sure often I use vocabulary which is unfamiliar to people who aren't geeks about leather. So, what better thing to do than a high level, very brief overview of leather, how it's made, what some of these different terms mean. What we're doing here is a down and dirty guide to leather. Now, before I begin, I want to state that there are unlimited combinations of these different things that I'm going to be talking about here. I don't have a chance to go through absolutely every type of leather, every process, but I'm going to try to hit on the big ones. Now, let's start right at the beginning. Leather is the skin of an animal. Now, there is such a thing as what they call vegan leather, which is really just using that term to describe a leathery substance made of different things. I know they have apple leather and some vinyl that you know kind of mimics leather properties, but that's not true leather. What we're talking about here is the hide of an animal. That could be a bovine, bison, horse, deer, kudu, lizard, ostrich, snake, a pig, goat, seal leather, camel leather, salmon leather, kangaroo, basically any animal that has skin, you can make leather out of it. Some of the most common types of leather that you're gonna see out there include things like cowhide, which is light and slightly spongy with a little bit more stretch. Now these can actually have more natural markings since cows tend to live a longer life. So they're gonna have things like stretch marks and scars, etc., which can be sanded and corrected out of the leather. Heifer leather, on the other hand, is heavier than cowhide with less stretch marks because a heifer is a cow who hasn't had calves yet. Steer hide is a product of the food industry and is typically pretty thick and tough. Bull hide is large and heavy with some wrinkling. Calf skin is smaller and lighter with a nice fine grain. You'll see this a lot on dress shoes. Bison produce a greasy hide with variations in thickness throughout. They also have more wrinkles. Horse hide can be broken down into a couple of different types of leather. Its stiffer coarse grain is actually higher in tensile strength. It's often shinier with better abrasion resistance, but it's less consistent leather throughout. And since leather comes from the food industry, we don't really eat a lot of horse over here in the US. It's typically more rare than cowhide, but you could break it down into things like the horse front or the horse quarter, which is tough and thin, and you often find this in jackets. There is strip, which is thicker than the fronts, and of course the shells which you'll get shell cordobin from which is water and wrinkle resistant and with an extremely fine grain and it can be polished to almost a mirror shine Kudu is a type of antelope which is hunted in the wild. There's plenty of natural scars and bug bites on this thing. It's a very tough yet very soft leather. And of course, there's your wide variety of exotics like lizard, caiman, and ostrich, snake, etc. These really could go into their own videos entirely, but let's just lump them under the category of exotic leather. Once the hide is removed from the animal in a process that I do not want to go into here, it needs to be preserved. And oftentimes, you'll find that preservation process through the use of tannins, which is the process of tanning. So how is leather tanned? Well, it really depends on what you wanna get out of it. The most common method, I'm talking 85% of leathers you'll find out there, is chrome tan. Now this was invented in 1858. It has twice the tensile strength of vegetable tanned leather. It's lighter weight than vegetable tanned leather because the leather doesn't fully absorb the chromium salts. It's a much faster process than vegetable tanned. And I mean, much, much faster. This results in what they call wet blue, which is a really odd bluish green hide, which needs to be dyed. The oldest style of tanning is called vegetable tanning. Now they found examples of this way back in the BC times in Egypt on stone coffin ornaments, but this has been around since probably leather has been popular. What they do is they use spruce and oak bark, sometimes olive leaves, rhubarb roots, or mimosa, depending on what the tanneries recipe is and what they want in their leather that comes out of it. But what it yields is a much different looking leather. It looks a lot more like what you expect leather to look like rather than the weird sickly wet blue that chrome tanned results. Now this takes a lot longer than chrome tanning, about 15 to 30 months. For a greasier leather, you're gonna wanna go with oil and fat tanning. Now this has been around for a long time too, since around 6,000 BC, and it uses fatty substances like tallow, brain, and oil to tan the leather. 
There is a process called tawning, which uses aluminum sulfate and saline, and it actually results in a white leather. This is how chamois is made. The problem with tawning, though, is that it can be washed off with water, and oftentimes this makes a much less durable leather, so you don't find it as common as vegetable tanned, or certainly not as common as chrome tanned. To add to the complexity of things, there is such a thing as retanning and combination tanning. And basically what it does is takes any of the things that I just mentioned and then combines them with another one. So to get the desired softness or the water resistance or the appearance, many leathers are retanned or combination tanned. So after your hide has been tanned and now it's sitting in front of you on a pallet ready to go, they have many different things that they can do with it. Oftentimes what they're going to do is split that hide into several parts. So what they're gonna do is basically cut it lengthwise along the surface and either drop the bottom and get rid of it and just use the top or maybe they'll use all of it. There is such a thing as a, a split which actually splits it into three parts with especially thick hides, but it's much less common. And these are all known as different types of things which you are definitely familiar with. The top side of the leather, or the grain side in other words, yields a nice, dense fiber structure which is used in fine leather items like gloves and stuff that requires tear resistance. This is the most valuable part of the hide and it is used in basically all high-end leather goods. Though some companies will take the lower split and they will emboss it and coat it to look just like top grain leather. So buyer beware. This is basically just like buying particle board furniture with a nice veneer on the top. And a lot of times you'll see this referred to as genuine leather. Now, overwhelmingly, automobile manufacturers use this type of leather on their interiors. It's usually shiny, kind of plasticky feeling, and has almost no breathability. So there is true top grain leather, and then there's the rest, which is basically looking like top grain leather. Full grain leather is leather which hasn't been buffed or sanded and shows the natural grain. A lot of times people think that full grain leather means a thicker hide and it really doesn't. What full grain leather is referring to is the surface treatment of the leather and in full grain there's very little surface treatment. Nubuck is a very fine and almost velvety feeling leather and now this process is achieved by rough sanding the top side of that leather. Nubuck is breathable, very soft, but it has low UV resistance and it'll actually fade very easily. It'll also stain really easily because it has that nappy textured surface. Suede is the uncoated bottom side of a leather split and it's rougher than Nubuck with thicker fibers and is often sanded and corrected. You'll find suede in a lot of different products, especially sneakers and gloves due to its high breathability. Rough out is the bottom side of leather and is the roughest of all. Usually it's not even corrected or sanded. You'll find a lot of times in work boots and other areas which require a tough and abrasion resistant leather. After the hide has been tanned and split, it can go through several different processes. One of which is hot stuffing, which is when they add waxes and oils and fats to the leather and it creates a pull-up leather. Now, probably the most popular version of this is Chrome Excel and it just, it, it basically lightens in color when you pull it or you bend it. You'll find this used a lot in footwear, in jackets and in luggage. The surface treatment could be one of many different types of things like drum dyeing. This is when they throw the leather into a rotating barrel with dyes and inks in order to color the leather basically whatever they want. There's also aniline dyeing which is a transparent liquid which doesn't create a coating on the leather. You'll find this on all suede and new bucks. Also on smooth leather, what it results in is a porous leather which actually absorbs water rather than beat it up and shed it off. There's pigmented layer, which is used in leathers which require water and dirt resistance, and this is typically sprayed on. And there is color embossing, where a colored film is actually pressed and bonded into the leather. After being dyed, it can then be embossed, and you'll find this is the way that they make basketballs and footballs and all kinds of stuff like that. Oftentimes, if you get bovine leather, which is actually then surface treated to look like elephant or some other exotic, but there's a couple of different ways to do this as well. There's blind embossing, which is the imprint of a texture onto a leather without any kind of color. There's color imprint, which is a colored film, as I mentioned earlier, which is pressed onto the leather. And then there's corrected grain embossing, which embosses the pattern of leather grain onto the surface of leather. Now, as I mentioned, you can do this with an exotic type of grain onto bovine leather and to make basically a cheaper version of an exotic. But sometimes they do this just to correct the grain a little bit when they want a nice even grain on the surface. 
Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, there are tons of different combinations of all these different techniques, and I'm sure some that I neglected to mention here, but I really wanted to hit the highlights and the ones that you're most commonly gonna see out there so you can make an informed purchase. All of this footage was actually when I went with the Cavalier to the Chicago Horween Tannery, and I did some video for him. He was kind enough to let me use it in this video, but this gives you a good idea of how this stuff actually happens, and seeing it take place in front of you really hits home. It's amazing to see the way that the vegetable tanning vats slowly rock the hides back and forth in the solution, the way that they're vacuum dried, and the way, you know, just watching the thing actually take shape and seeing something go from the hide with hair on it and all that stuff to a fine piece of leather at the end. It was very, very interesting. It was a great experience and one that I'm very thankful to John for, uh, for sharing with me. So until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you next time.